Let ready. me know when you're ready. I'm ready now. Oh, right. Okay. Come and come and join me. Oh, yeah. Let me turn this one. Yeah. Put it over here. Put it over there. That's it. Right, you're going for a visit at prison. You have to put your stuff out of the way. Yeah. Don't let me forget it, though. Well, don't you let me forget mine either. Okay. Okay. Come, join me for the podcast. I'll remember yours if you remember mine. I'll touch yours if you touch mine. Okay, get in. So, get closer to me. Do you just want to go into it? Do you want to, like, uh, jazz each other up first, or...? Yeah. You look very nice today. Thanks. So do you. Thanks. Hello and welcome to the Just Ride Films podcast, episode 19, which means we're one away from a very special episode. Um, my name is Chip Thompson and I am joined as always by my co-host, co-founder and fellow DVD alphabetizer, Mr. Dominic Pillow. Hello. Hello. I don't think I said that word right. I don't think it is a word. That's probably fair. Uh, if this is your first time listening, hello, we make up words. Uh, we're also two independent filmmakers who are all about supporting indie film and we are doing so in podcast form. Uh, I like to think of us as the podcast equivalent of Donald Trump. Uh, none of us have the foggiest idea how to run a country, and none of us should ever be given the slightest bit of power. And also, I reckon in about 30 years, we all, we're going to need another bit of roadkill to pay on our heads. Yeah, I'm not sure. I... No, not feeling that one this week? No, not really. That's fair, because he's... Oh, and then he'd said a bad word. Yeah. Uh, let's just ignore... Let's, let's not get political again. That didn't um, that didn't work out very well last time. I feel like the opening segment and the intro becomes quite political, um, so maybe we should just move on. Okay. This country, you've got to make the money first. Then when you get the money, you get the power. Then when you get the power, then you get the woman. Well, we begin the podcast... At, oh, let's try that one again. What's a podcast? The podcast. The podcast. We begin the podcast, podcast. <laughs> as we do every week, with a film review of a film that we have seen and then review. Uh, John, would you like to go first? Yeah, I was in very. I was in two minds about what to review uh, this week. Is that because you're super smart and you've got two brains? No, oh. it's because uh, I did go to the cinema, mm -hmm. but I'd rather talk about something I saw on DVD. Okay, what did you see at the cinema? I saw Me, Earl and the Dying Girl. I want to see that, was it good? Yeah, I liked it. Excellent. Do your DVD review. Uh, yeah, so my DVD review uh, was another uh, goodbye at CEX. As they all are. Um, I bought Return to the Batcave. Nice. Now, this is what's really interesting about this is uh, it's about the original Adam West Batman series. Now, I bought it thinking that it was a documentary about the making of uh, the Adam West series, and it was a them now looking back, slightly tongue-in-cheek documentary. It's not that. It's something far more interesting and, and weirder. And it was, a, it was... It's so nice when you go and watch something, uh, and it's not what you expect it to be. It is always... So, if, if it's a good thing, like, yeah, if it yeah. goes on the side of... Because well, what I didn't see... You know in CEX they have those labels that go along the bottom? The price some, ones? Yeah, and they sign of obscure what it's called. And and that's... If I'd seen the whole title, it might have given me more of an idea of what to expect. Was the whole title not on the DVD case? It is. It's Return to the Back Cave, but in the subtitle, which was covered by the label... It's called The Misadventures of Adam and Burr. <laughs> uh, and that, that and that I think, is an important aspect. I feel like it. that should be the main title. Yeah, because what it is... I, I don't know even how to begin to describe this uh, film. Um, and it's, and it starts off with Adam West and Burt Ward now uh, going to like a charity event. And it's like a reunion. Uh, and the Batmobile is stolen. So Adam and Bert have to try and get the Batmobile back. I love and, this film. And uh, it's uh, while that's going on, they ha are having flashbacks <laughs> about how they made Batman. And obviously, in the flashbacks set in the 60s, they've got actors playing them. But it's done... The whole thing is done very tongue-in-cheek. It's very self-aware. The, it's, it's, they basically made it in the style of the Adam West Batman episodes... But it's like a biopic of Matt, of Adam West and Burt Ward. It done it in the style of Batman, the TV series. This is amazing. Yeah, it is amazing. 
You're going to lend this to me? Yeah, I That's am. not a question. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And it's got cameos from different people that are in the series, and it's just completely mental, but in the, such a good way. Like, it was... it. Past my expectations beyond <laughs> possibility because I bought it just thinking, oh, this would be a fun documentary of because I love the Adam West series and uh, I thought it'd be a fun documentary and it would be you know, something I'll enjoy. Throw away, it's far more interesting than that. It is really, really bizarre but really good and it's very uh, affectionate. Uh, about them so you know you don't expect anything hard hitting about the Adam West and Burt Ward you know it, it glosses over some of the maybe slightly sleazier aspects of their personality uh, but it's very you know it's very affectionate and it's very surreal and very just crazy and I loved it every moment of it I'm not surprised I think I will <laughs> yeah it sounds like something that would make a really interesting like triple bill with I'm still here and JCVD which yeah. I don't think you've seen. Have you seen that? No, I haven't. Okay, no, I... I'll lend that to you. Yeah. Um, because they're both kind of not documentaries, but uh, they portray something that is they portray it as real, but it's not. Yeah. You know, it's all scripted. I'm, I yeah. mean, I'm still here is slightly different in that sense, in that he's playing off, you know, the people that are interviewing him and stuff like that. But there's still a fictionalization about it. You could also then add to that quadruple bill twenty thousand. Days on Earth, the Nick Cave film, because that's again a documentary that's very fictionalised. Um, we should start a film festival, which we is should. about all these like <laughs> amazing not documentaries. Yeah. Uh, uh, podcast peeps, if you know of any more that would make uh, a great film festival with these other films, get in touch. And I would be really interested in anyone else who's seen this film because I didn't know anything about it <laughs> and it was such a joy to find it it was a, like a like finding a gold dust and I if you're a fan of Batman and, and the Adam West series then go check it out and let us know what you think one final thing how much did you pay for it in CEX I paid four pound and that what? was it's just quite expensive for a CX. CX buy, that is. Yeah, but you know, it was worth every penny. <laughs> Would you have paid a fiver for it? Oh, yeah. Sign of quality. Yeah. Okay, so moving on, I'm going to review a film now. And I'm not going to beat it about the bush, uh, this one. This is the worst film I've ever seen in my entire life. Uh, so it's going to contrast quite well with your review. Yeah. Uh, this week, I watched Pro Wrestlers vs. Zombies. <laughs> this is a film that you made me buy. Do you remember this? You made me spend five English pounds on this. Did I? But yes. Because originally I wasn't going to buy it because I saw it, laughed, because I reckon I'm a wrestling fan. That is my guilty pleasure. And I saw it, recognised the names, picked it up, and you went, you have to buy it. And for some reason you control me, and I did. <laughs> I completely forgotten about that. The thing was, is <coughs> from the title, obviously knew it was going to be bad. I bought it because I recognised some of the wrestlers, and I thought... You know, it's going to be tongue-in-cheek, it's going to be silly, it's going to be bad, but I might enjoy it. That all went out the window when, at the start of credits, I saw that it was a fucking trauma film. Right. I despise trauma films. I know there's a lot of cult love for them, but I they've scarred me emotionally, mentally, and physically, actually, as well. So I don't like them. Do yeah. not like them. I will tell you that story one day, but okay. not now. Um, so, Plot. Plot. Okay, so there's a wrestler called Shane Douglas. He, uh, at the start of the film, accidentally, in quotation marks, kills another wrestler in the ring. But the next day he's having dinner with his family and he's fine about it. The promoter of the wrestling organisation, it turns out that that was his brother. So to seek revenge on Shane Douglas, he raises an army of zombies. Rather than get a gun and shoot him, he, he murders a nurse in a sacrificial ritual and raises an army of zombies. And then books Shane Douglas and a bunch of all these other former form, famous wrestlers into a, a wrestling show at an abandoned prison for some reason, and then sets his army of zombies on them. That's so, the plot. Sounds as mental as uh, Return to the Batcave. <laughs> Just in a slightly different way. Um, everything about it is terrible. Uh, production values, scripts, editing, direction, cinematography, the acting... It's just all diabolical and not even in an enjoyable way. It's not tongue-in-cheek. It's played fairly seriously. Right. 
Uh, and if I wasn't watching it with my cousins, who are also wrestling fans, who and in, just exchanging looks of like, what is going on? <laughs> it jumps in points on the story. Characters get separated for no apparent reason. They all get their wrestling moves in. They're all wearing their merchandise, so you know to go and buy a Matt Hardy shirt afterwards. Yeah. Um, the number one draw, Kurt Angle, who's a very famous wrestler and a former gold medalist in the Olympics, gets killed off in the first three minutes. But, and he just like that's one of the reasons I bought it. The only saving grace is that it uh, stars Rowdy Roddy Piper, who recently passed away. Yeah. And I think I know why now. It was this film. <laughs> um, he's he's actually like he can actually act a bit. Yeah. And there's the one. Wasn't he in a John Carpenter? Yeah, film? they live. Have you never seen They Live? No, never oh, seen it. So good, so so good. We uh, I need I don't own it, but I need to buy it and we yeah. should watch it. It would good. It will make a very good mandate film. Yeah. Um, so yeah, he's actually got some credentials. Um, it is a bit sad actually because a lot of the guys in it, a lot of the wrestlers, you kind of feel like they did it because they fall on the hard times and need the money, and they're not necessarily represented very well within the film. Yeah. And it just strikes a desperation in a way. So it's, a, it's kind of sad. Yeah. And just no enjoyment from it whatsoever. Don't watch it. Never I, ever watch this film. I've no intention because one thing I don't really, I don't like wrestling at all. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, two, I don't like shitty horror films. So I try my. Yeah, I just uh, thought you should watch it because it it was fun. It looks funny, and I, I like but making. Well, thank you, you for that. I like making you buy things. You do <laughs> you especially DVDs. Yeah. This is all your fault. I know, but so tell me, as a wrestling fan, then you, do you not think it it could be enjoyed on any level. No. no, none. So that means that no one can enjoy it. No one. Zom not zombie fans, not wrestling fans, not even trauma fans, because they have a quite a hardcore base. Yeah. You know, like things like uh, Newcom High and the Toxic Avenger. You know, they're kind of cult classics and stuff. Yeah. No, I don't think even they'd like it. It's just ah, oh, there's just like it's so obvious that they've just lit it with one light bulb, and like people are talking and it's just you can't see their faces because there's shadows over them. The end. The end sequence. Roddy Piper's shirt goes from blue to white, blue to white, blue to white, in every cut. And it's just like, that's the most basic of continuity. And it's just, the characters turn up, you don't know who they are, you don't know where they go. They Some of them are horrible looking people, and just that really nasty, seedy way that you wouldn't, you think they'd smell a bit like old grease, you know? Well. Oh, I just, I, I didn't you, like this film. You're getting quite... Up about <laughs> I it. am. I am. I like wrestling. Damn it! I want to see my wrestlers in positive things. I don't want them to turn out to be murderers and racists. It's not nice. No. If you were a wrestling fan, you'd get that. I do get that. Oh, I, you do. Okay, yeah. so that's made me. That's Hulk Hogan, wasn't it? Yeah, and he, Jimmy Superfly Snooker's just been arrested for murder as well. I don't know who that is. That's fine. You're talking to me? Well, who the hell else are you talking? You're talking to me? So now that we've reviewed two amazing films that we've both watched. Uh, I think it's time to review an independent short film. What do you say? I think that's a very good idea because we're an independent film podcast. Yes, we are. And Wrestlers vs. Zombies is not an indie film. It's, Isn't it? It's not even a film. No. It's a turd that someone shat out. <laughs> <laughs> so this week, uh, on, more, on a more positive note, uh, we reviewed a... Well, we watched a film. We're going to review it. A film called Paths of Hate. Yeah. Uh, this was a, it's a small um, Polish uh, animation and it's all done in a cell shaded kind of style. Yeah. I found this because there is a stop motion animation guy I like called Lee Hardcastle and I'm subscribed to his YouTube channel and he made a music video for a band called Gunship which yeah. I quite liked and then I checked out some of their other videos and one of their other music videos is the last four minutes of this film. Right. And I was like, oh, that would be a good one to check out and maybe review for the podcast. And here we are, Paths of Hate. What do we think? Are you asking me? Yes, by, by we, I mean you. Okay. Um, I ha have mi I have mixed feelings, I have to be honest. Okay. Um, what do you want me to start with? Uh, start with the good, just so we don't have a whole tidal wave of bad. There isn't a tidal wave of bad, because Come I made... Come wrestlers versus zombies. Okay, yeah, fair enough, fair enough. Uh, so, I firstly, the animation is absolutely fantastic. Mm -hmm. It re really uh, reminded me of that sort of anime, sort of Ghost in the Shell 2 animation, where it's kind of animation, but it's kind of uh, digital as well. Yeah. And I don't know, what it seemed to me that it was uh, 
what you call rotoscope. Is it rotoscope? Well, yeah, it's kind of a mixture of rotoscoping and cell shading as well. Yeah. It's that kind of style. It's a nice, I, it's a really nice look. I like it. I like that look because it's got that slightly unreal feel where it, you, the movements are clearly real, but the images aren't. That's why I think because... Um, Something a film like uh, Scanner Darkly or something yeah. like that, you you can tell it's rotoscope. Yeah. This I think is probably more likely to be cell shaded. Yeah. Um, because I don't think they would have got actual because it's well set up the plot. It's about two fighters in yeah. aeroplanes. Yeah. Fighting. Yeah. That's about as much as we need to say. I a think. dog fight. A dog fight. Yeah. yeah. I think it's meant to be World War Two. Yeah. Uh, it's not explicit, but there's yeah. hints towards that. Yeah. Yeah. I really liked that. I have to say. Um, the two things, I mean, I really liked the way it looked. I really liked, it was really engaging visually. Um, but there was one thing that, there was a couple of things that I just didn't work for me. Now, the, the first thing was the music. I found the music quite distracting. In the, the bits where they were, because I was really engaged in it on an emotional level, uh, in, in the first half of the movie, you know, it was obviously set during the war. You know, it was a, it was engaging, and there was this, you know, sequence, which had some sort of emotional punch because obviously, that really happened, and I just felt the music was a bit like, spoofy James Bond, you know, that do 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 thing going on, and then at the end, it obviously the 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 tone changes. Uh, and uh, it becomes more the music becomes even more full on and I just thought it was a little heavy handed the music it's interesting you say that because I agree to, with that point to a certain extent um, I quite like the music because the opening, the start of the film is set up kind of like an action movie and it's yeah. a chase sequence and I thought the music kind of complemented that quite well and then when things change and it becomes more of a metaphor kind of thing I kind of like the music there where I agree with you is I think the the ending of the film, when that last piece of music becomes quite a heavy, almost rap metal kind yeah. of track, Yeah. I didn't like that. I no. thought that was, like you said, heavy-handed, uh, overdid, and it kind of took away the subtlety from me. I think that would have been such a fantastic sequence and shot yeah. if the music had either become more subtle or just completely dropped. Well, the main... Th- and my main issue with with film, I'm really sorry to say, because I I just want to reiterate, there are lots of things that I absolutely loved about it. Like it is fa- it's a fantastic piece of work, and it, like one of the best things that we've reviewed, I think. So I just I don't want to like sound like I'm dissing it all the time because I'm really not. I I just think there's there were two things that stood out for me. The one was the music. The other thing, just on a personal level, the the twist of the film and what subsequently came after that just didn't work for me at all. So, uh, in what sense? I just thought it it's... Uh, again, heavy-handed? Because it's, it's... Heavy-handed, but also kind of, again, kind of undermined everything that had come before. And I guess what I liked about it uh, was that it worked more... It wasn't just a chase sequence because it was dealing with sort of World War Two. If it was a, just a chase sequence, it could be guys in the present day. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Or it could be guys, you know, in cars now. But the fact that it had this sort of period setting and it's this sense of drama and it threw you straight in and you were, you know, related to it. And then it takes a, a change, in a genre change, uh, which just didn't work for me. And I thought it was just a little... And, and I know that's probably quite hard to hear, because obviously that's kind of the but you know that's like the twist of the film. That's that's you know that that's kind of one of the key elements of the film in a way. Um, when you're coming up with the idea, that's kind of I guess where what would I'd imagine would have been a starting point in a way. But well, again, I think I slightly disagree with you because I think I I think I read it slightly differently, uh, or maybe I don't. But in the sense that um, yeah, there's definitely a shift in gears. But for me, it becomes because um, you know how we were saying at the start, it's it's it is World War Two, but it's not explicit. Yeah, I think the whole idea is that it's about you know um, this hate that uh, human beings can develop when they're in warfare, and I think at that point it becomes uh, less about World War Two and about conflict in general and about wars in general rather than being that uh, exact period. Yeah, and I think that's that's kind of the message because in the end credits, um, there's lots of images of different 
men fighting from different er- uh, eras and stuff yeah. like that. Um, and I, I, that's what I quite liked about it. But um, I agree with you that it, it is a bit heavy handed. I actually thought it worked better in the music video that I saw because the music, the track in there is more kind of a downbeat kind of thing. Right. And I think I, it just works better with the with the images for me. Yeah. I yeah. I like, but I like I say the first half I just could not fault in any way. It's just the last half just didn't work for me at all. Interesting. And I sometimes I uh, like I said I think sometimes with short films there's that there's this idea that there has to be some kind of twist mm. or there has to be something that changes your perception uh, and I think sometimes it's nice to just stick with something if you've got something good just stick with it and you don't have to have a twist just yes. for the sake of it yeah that I agree with that's, that's yeah. a really well made point because I think we found that up with a lot of short films that we've watched yeah. um, so that's interesting then we both kind of kind of similar but conflicting views on the film of Parcel Hate um, I think I think that the podcast peeps should go and watch it. There'll be a link in the description and they should let us know what they think. Definitely. Here's the thing. I don't give a company fuck about your moral conundrum, you meat-headed shit sack. Well, this part of the podcast is the section where one of us uh, every week will present the other one with a filmmaking or film-related subject to uh, get into and have a little chat about. This week, it is your turn. Your turn. It is your turn. My turn. You're president now. So what? Yeah. Uh, four, four more years. Four more years of Dom, uh, and in your four more years, what is your inaugural filmmaking film subject? I brought it back. Yes, for me this week. <laughs> <laughs> Good work. Thanks. Well, I was thinking about uh, the film that we just watched. Actually, Path of Hate. Yeah. Ooh, by the way, the director was Damien Ninnell. Yeah. I didn't get that in. So Damien Ninnell directed. That yeah, film. and great work, Damien. Great animation. Loved it. Uh, like I say, I have a couple of reservations, but I respect the film. Okay, and this leads into your filmmaking subject. Yes, it does, because thinking about animation. Yes. Now, this is. We have both <laughs> kind of gone down a route of live action film, haven't we? We have. And I'm just interested in. But at the same time, we both like a lot of animation. We mm-hmm. watch a lot of animation, whether it be, uh, you know. Batman the Animated Series, Studio Ghibli, or uh, Aardman. You know, we we like we all like a bit of animation, and I'm just interested to know whether you would ever consider going into animation or making an animated film, and if you did, mm. which what direction would you go in? What what interests you? Are you interested in stop motion? Are you in 2D? Good question, good question. In digital animation? Where where would you go with that? Well, uh, first of all, my artistic skills, as my storyboards will attest to, are horrendous. Uh, so I can't draw, can't animate, don't have the patience. I tried, I've tried stop motion before and just been really bad at it and don't have the patience for it. Uh, so on an actual physical production level, no, couldn't do it. Physically couldn't do it. But I would like to write one. Because I think it's a it, animation lets you get into a world where absolutely anything is possible, and you don't have to necessarily worry about budget or you know how to shoot it because there's there's different ways around it like live action films, um, so I really like that idea of having this freedom to write something. In terms of style, uh, yeah, it would be an Aardman animation. I would absolutely love to write and I like Wallace and Gromit TV series, uh, Curse of the Worm Rabbit, phenomenal films. Pirates in Adventures of Scientists is brilliant as well. They had me laughing all the way through. And it's what I love about those films is the way you can just go through them frame by frame and just see all the in jokes and the background jokes because there's so much going on. And to just be able to sit down with a script where, you know, when you're writing a script, you might uh, write a little bit about, you know, what's happening, uh, set up the description, that sort of thing. To be able to just write on, in the background is a really funny joke as well. Mm. And to just completely have that freedom over the set and have it all there and would be so much fun, I think. So I would definitely go for an Ardman stop motion animation. And it's good because it's such an amazing craft as well. And I know digital animation is a very skilled art as well. But for me, to see all the, the little details and the movements and the hard work that people have gone through to make this film is just something I really admire. Mm. What about yourself? Um, well, I've been watching quite a... They had a season on Film 4 of all the Studio Ghibli films. Right. And 
now I'm uh, living in the lap of luxury and have my own flat and everything, I've got uh, Sky Plus, so I've just been recording them, and I've been watching quite a few of them. And what I really love about uh, that style is, like you say, your imagination can go wild. You can do anything. Anything is possible in animation. And you can get away with things creatively that you, which are very hard to do in live action, even if you know, let alone with a big budget. But with a small budget, you know, don't even go there. So, but I also the other thing I really love about uh, that sort of animation is that you can kind of go into places that you just can't normally go. Like they're just a lot of those animations just really weird. And they really trippy, and they go into really hallucinogenic kind of psychological places that you know are quite. It's quite hard to pull off, and doing it, but you can do it visually in a really exciting way through animation. So, unlike you, I guess uh, the reason I've never really gone into animation is laziness. <laughs> I'm a lazy. You can draw that. You've got good art skills. Oh well, that's very kind of you to say, but I am lazy. Yeah, I, I'm happy to draw one picture of a person, but I don't want to draw 24 frames per second of them. I guess that's so, why that on my birthday that year when you drew a picture of me doing a Wii uh, and then gave it to me as a present, that's probably why you didn't animate it. Yeah. So really I should be thankful. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I guess what I would like to... I'd like to be a bit like Miyazaki. I'd design, I'd design all the characters and all of, come up with all the ideas and then I'd just have a staff of hundreds of people to just do all the drawings and do all the hard work. <laughs> so, you know, you're I, a crack in a whip. Yeah, so I'm quite happy to, to design the characters and come up with the characters and, and to ha be the creative genius behind it all. But then I just need loads of lackeys to do all the hard work. So uh, Don't we all? Yeah, so, <laughs> so yeah, I would definitely do something in the kind of Ghibli style, but, uh, but obviously in my own way too. I'd like to see that personally. I would like to see an animation done by you. Yeah, I would too. I just <laughs> need a hundred blackies. Yeah. Okay, well, well, we'll go out and find some after this. Good question, Dom. Excellent. Well done. Thank you. Well, I mean, it's pretty hairy in there. It's, it's Charlie's point. Charlie, don't surf! Speaking of questions, we have two questions this week. Ooh. One is from Twitter and one is from real life. Oh. So, uh, with his usual uh, top standard of uh, questions, uh, at Ross T. Miller asked this week, uh, well, I don't actually have it in front of me, so I'm doing this from memory, so I apologise if I screw up your question, Ross, but he wanted to know, uh, is there such a thing as a perfect film, and if so, what is the perfect film? I mean, obviously, the answer is Evil Dead 2, so moving on. Well, uh, no, no, oh. the perfect film's Vertigo, obviously. <laughs> no, I think it's Evil Dead 2. No, Vertigo. Okay, what if they did, like, a crossover film? Evil Vertigo 2. <laughs> My brain can't even comprehend <laughs> that. Ooh, that would be a, that would be a fun animation to make. Yeah. Yeah. So but, well, does he does he want us to answer that sensibly or probably? I mean, I think fairly we should because Ross sends us a lot of good questions every week. So. So what was the question again? Uh, is there such a thing as a perfect film? I don't think there is. The thing is with films is that, well, like any art form, it is completely subjective. And uh, what I mean by that is we all have our own favourite films or the things that we like. None of us can agree on everything, you know. It's open to interpretation. So I don't think you can say a film is perfect because it can be perfect to one person, but it's not to someone else. Absolutely. You yeah. know, and I, and as a, I guess to turn that back onto ourselves, I might think Vertigo is the perfect film. You might think Evil Dead 2 is the perfect film. In terms of making films, I don't think as a filmmaker you ever feel like you've made a perfect film because if you did, then you would never have to make a film again. That is an excellent point. And just to finish that off as well, um, also I think really if you spent time critically analysing, I mean everyone's got a film that they look back on, whether it be nostalgia or if it's just actually a really good film and they love, you know, everyone's got their favourites. But really if you sat there and just tried to critically analyse anything, you could find a flaw in it. You know, and, there's always going to be something. And the 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 the, the damn thing is that the the thing you don't want to become is you you don't want to become George Lucas. Because no, no one wants that. No one wants that. And George Lucas is an example of why there isn't the perfect film because he has spent years touching up his films that he made like thirty years ago, 
like doing special editions. So I thought you were going to slander George Lucas for a minute. Then carry on. No, no, I'm not. But I'm, I'm and I'm not even going to go down. I saw your face. You're very childish. I know. I'm sorry. Um, you know he's. You know he keeps tinkering with his film. Uh, stop it. <laughs> Stop saying funny words. Go on, Stop being the... so childish. <laughs> Seriously, I, we want our podcast peeps to respect us. If they've to... listened to any previous episodes, that's out the window already. Well, speak for yourself. No, I'm speaking on for us. You can't speak for me. Oh, I can. No, you can't. I can't, I just didn't. Anyway, uh, the point I'm trying to make... George is... Lucas is... A... George Lucas is someone who has played around with his films and just make some shitter. Yes. And you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't do that. You should just make another film. Excellent point. Thank you, Ross. Please send us another question because they lead to uh, really good debates and then some childish comments from me. So, excellent. Question number two this week comes from real life and it comes from a lady called Rebecca Windsor. Oh, who's she? Uh, She is the life collaborator. Uh, And (laughs) Peggy wants to know... Um, if we could uh, adapt a book into a film, what would we do and how would we do it? Should I go first because I've had time to think about this? Yeah. Um, so I actually have three. Um, the first two are kind of cheating a little bit because the first one is called um, Confederacy of Dunces, um, which was written by a young author who died before it was published and his mum managed to get it published um, after his death. Uh, and it's kind of difficult to set up the plot because it's centred around this one a horrible character that you kind of get to learn. It's very funny, and I highly recommend it. You definitely go check it out. But I do believe that at some point that was already scheduled to be in production. Yeah. So I may have missed out on that one. I just want to just say something to you, weirdly. Yeah. Who told you about that book? Vic. Was it? Okay, because Ewan, our friend, who is also a filmmaker, yes. who listens to this podcast... Hi, Ewan. Uh, he loved that book and wanted to adapt it as a film as well. So maybe you should meet up, and between the two of you, you could probably do it. Yeah, we could probably buy the rights between us. Yeah, if they're not, if they're not making it already. Um, anyway, uh, the second film is a film called Snow Crash, which is a kind of um, sci-fi esque book, yeah. which is uh, pretty amazing. But again, apparently uh, being adapted by Joe Cornish at the moment, which I think will be right. a really interesting mix. Uh, yeah. He must be a fan of the book. Uh, so I'd like to see his take on it. So I'm going to settle on uh, The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Night. Uh, nice. Because it's already a play, and what they did with the play when I saw it, because I see plays now, um, was very different to the book, yeah. uh, very inventive, and I would like to do that in a film, because um, because the character is, you know, he suffers from Asperger's and quite a few other things, yeah. and it's all from his perspective. It's a really interesting look on the world, and I think I'd like to do that visually, using his voice but in a film medium sorry to be pedantic but are you surely not adapting the play not the book though? no be the book because I liked the play but I liked the book more and the book is what I want to adapt ok what about you so you've got three then I'm going to settle on one because the other two are technically are were in production ok well what I would like to go with one of my dream projects has been to take the story of the Buddha and adapt it so I guess I wouldn't be taking one particular text but a variety of different texts and interweaving them I really like um, and I'd be quite influenced by um, Siddhartha by Herman Hess and that would be a big influence on the on the book I really like films that are about sort of physical and spiritual journeys and I've always been interested in Eastern philosophy and in Buddhism specifically so that's something that I want to do that's like a a dream feature film project but it's not adapting a specific book no it counts though yeah it's a text and yeah yeah that's a good answer I'd like again I would like to see you do that yeah I think you do it very well thank you yeah thanks for the question Beckles you want to know how I got these scars Okay, we come to that part of the podcast where um, normally every week you would do a plug. Yeah. Um, but this week you want to do something a bit different. Yeah. Um, normally I don't do this sort of thing. Uh, I don't talk about personal stuff that can make me cry. But I want it was it seems relevant today because um, my granddad passed away uh, a couple of days ago, and he was an extraordinary man and someone that was always a a massive inspiration to me 
it's weird actually watching that I forgot to say watching that uh, part of hate uh, uh, kind of it's, the first half was really relevant for me because my granddad was in the RAF so it was like a weirdly fitting that we that was our film this week but uh, anyway uh, I wanted to talk about him because, specifically on this podcast because uh, when I was about I guess about 11 years old maybe maybe younger than that actually um, my granddad gave myself and my brother uh, his Super 8 camera uh, and basically at that age me and my brother used to make these very silly but fun little Super 8 movies we're called the Templars uh, and we made uh, we made Super 8 movies of like Man From Uncle and uh, we did this one Samurai's Revenge which was like in tribute to Kurosawa and we used to just make these films and I guess my brother sort of uh, went on, became more interested in kind of film academic stuff and, you know, writing about film criticism. And But I got into filmmaking, and if it wasn't for my granddad giving me that Super 8 camera and making those silly films for my brother, um, I would never be a filmmaker today. Uh, so that was one of the best gifts that he gave me he gave me filmmaking uh, because of course the other thing was uh, I used to always spend my Sunday afternoon at my grandparents and on the TV there'd always be classic movies like Hitchcock you know, classic westerns uh, and I just spent my childhood watching these classic movies and then I guess trying to remake them uh, and I'm still doing that <laughs> in a way uh, so, th yeah, I just want to, you know, say thanks, Grandad, and you know, you'll you'll be missed, and thank you for giving me the gift of film. Okay, normally, like um, when I'm editing the podcast, I'll put like a movie quote in, but I'm not going to do that for this part. Okay, I'm just going to let it go before we go into the outro. Cool, cool. Okay, uh, that was lovely. Uh, that's it for another week. Um, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, do you tune in on digital now, or is that? Do people tune in? Uh, they tune into their iPods. Although, the modern world, they more likely tune out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you did enjoy the episode, <laughs> <laughs> please consider leaving us a rating or review on and subscribing, in fact, on iTunes. Um, it helps us out a lot. It helps us get more eyes on the podcast, and it means that we can keep supporting indie film and indie artists, which is what we want to do. Um, all our previous episodes are available free of charge. I don't remember doing that. Uh, and are available now to download on our SoundCloud page, um, which um, you're probably listening on, or you can find a link in the description. Uh, we have a website, which is justarrivefilms.co.uk. There are pictures of us and bits of our scripts and films and posters and all manner of exciting and wondrous things. Uh, we are on Facebook, uh, facebook.com slash justarrivefilms. We are on the Twitter, at justarrivefilms. Dom, what is your personal Twitter account? It's at Dom, P I L L A I. And do you say interesting things on P I L L A I? Uh, normally, I talk about what I've been watching. So, uh, sort of. Sometimes. I don't really say anything. I just put hashtag now watching. Yes. Return to the back cave. <laughs> <laughs> Again. And I am at Thompson underscore film, and I just talk about any old rubbish. Yeah. So again, different opinions. You know, come yeah. and give us a follow and unfollow if you're really unhappy. Um, yeah. So next week is our twentieth episode. Yeah. For our tenth, I surprised you with a super surprise question. Yeah. And we had a long discussion about if we're going to make it as filmmakers. Yeah. Next week, are we going to have a super special one from you? Oh, it's going to be special. Is and it? it's going to be super as well. Is it going to be George Lucas special? No, it's not. Oh, thank God for that. Um, cool. So I will look forward to that. <laughs> Thanks so much, Podcast Peeps. We'll see you next week. Bye. <laughs>